Hey, John Rob here interviewing Richard Johnson of the Skid. I guess initially um, the interview is spot, sparked really by the change of the lineup and the inevitability in a band in a long term project, isn't it? Yeah, especially if you, I mean, most of us these days are playing with musicians who are in lots of different bands and they have different commitments. Uh, fortunately, and maybe unfortunately for me, I was working with Bruce and Jamie Watson, who are, um, their main event is Big Country. So, you know, the diary was managed by their agent, but Big Country are playing a lot. They play all the time. And I was having to turn down a lot of stuff that I quite wanted to do. And it didn't really bother me that much because I've always got other things going on in my life. But then it started to like kind of slightly irritate me that I couldn't do things. And, you know, and I understand that that's their main event. You know, that's always going to be the case. So without any acrimony or anything poisonous, because, you know, these things could be misread, um, we decided that I would create a new version of the skids for the upcoming gigs I've got in the UK. And then I'm off to Australia and New Zealand and Hong Kong. And uh, then hopefully uh, a big tour of Germany. So I think, yeah, if the time's right, you know, and, and uh, they were cool about it because their diary is pretty much booked out for the whole of n- next year. So they had no time at all. And the Skids, I think they love playing with the Skids, but it was always their second band. Whereas the Skids is my band, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, honestly, John, I didn't really expect to be doing anything with the skids at this stage of my life. But I've had so much fun doing it that sometimes the fun can be kind of addictive. You know, you just want to keep on doing it. So how do you put together a new skid, skids 3.0, I guess? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's not been as difficult as I thought. I tried out a few people because I've got my other band, The Armoury Show, doing a few gigs here and there. And I work with these young you know, strangely enough, in retrospect, if you look back at the era that I'm from, there was only one Stuart Adamson and there was only one John McGeeck when he played with me in the Armoury show. These people were like one-offs. But nowadays, there's a thousand of them. There's a thousand <laughs> young people who can do what those guys did. And they're extraordinary. So there's a whole pool of people out there. But actually, what I've done is go with... I want it, I want the... I want to be the gigs to be fun for me as well as the audience, which is a big part of a skids gig. And so I'm going with a friend of mine, Martin Metcalf, from uh, you'll know him from Goodbye Mr. McKenzie and the Filthy Tongues, and uh, his bass player Finn Wilson. Primarily because uh, Martin and I do a lot of um, gigs together, the two of us. And secondly, Martin wrote a lot of the the songs on Burning Cities and more recently Destination Dusseldorf, which is, was a big success for us. And, I mean, he even wrote the title track with me. So, you know, we've got a very tight relationship. It's You know, when I'm with him, we laugh a lot, but we're serious about stuff as well. We've got the same taste in art. We like the kind of German art from the Weimar era. We read the same kind of literature. Uh, we're interested in the same kind of poetry. So, and musically... You know, although he's more of a, I think he falls more into your terrain of gothdom um, <clears throat> than I do. I still love that music. You know, I, I love that music. And I think probably the bridge between the two is maybe the Banshees and Echo and the Bunny Men, you know, a bit of Joy Division. They bridge the gap for me between a kind of post-punk thing and, and what you would call is much more of a a, a pure goth experience. So Martin kind of bridges that, which I like. I like that music. I like the aura of that. So, And, and you can feel a little hint of that in some of the Skid songs. So I'm, I'm hoping he brings a wee bit of that into it for me. He's certainly got amazing stage presence, which is important for me. I think when a band go on stage, they need to have presence. Um, I don't mean in a pompous way, like us and them. I just mean you're, like, you're looking at people who are there to deliver. You know, and, and I think uh, he's got that. So that excites me. But we, we get on incredibly well. So that's going to make life very, very easy for me. And and we'll have a lot of laughs because, you know, being on the roads, as you know, can be a bit spinal tap sometimes, you know, and um, living out of each other's pockets, you start to see idiosyncrasies in people that they end up irritating you. And, then, and in normal life, they would never irritate you because... But because you're so close, that things that 
you know, you should be beyond being irritated by begin to irritate you, you know, the way people eat even, you know, you suddenly go, ah, <laughs> or behave. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, and it's, you know, Martin's gone through his own uh, troubles in life um, with addictions, and he's come through it. So he finds it easy to work with me because I don't really care about alcohol. It's not an important thing in my life. Uh, so a skids gig backstage is not very rock and roll. Uh, certainly on this upcoming tour, because alcohol is not really part of how we live. We eat quite healthily. Um, I couldn't do what I do on stage, John, if I didn't look after myself. Um, so, you know, I think it's uh, we've got a lot in common, and I think we'll have a lot of fun together. And we don't need anything to to, to amplify that, you know. So we're we're the generation now who come through all of that shit and don't care about it. I mean, with skids, I mean, obviously the music's important, but it's the aesthetic to the band as well, isn't it? So when you're getting members to join or, you know, and all the different sort of lineups, the few different lineups, that's an important consideration as well. You have to, they, they have to understand what the thing is about. It's not just a bunch of chords, is it? Indeed, I think so. And I think there's a legacy there. Um, you know, Shoot Adamson's guitar playing was very inventive for the era and he created a style. You know, he had his own peculiar style that that you know we started when we started off we were typically inspired by the same things as everybody else you know the clash uh maybe even further back mc5 for me personally it was always Iggy pop and alex harvey were my two great ideas of front men um so but when we kind of overcome the initial period of punk we started to develop our own style i think you know, Sure Adamson's guitar player has got a real craft to it and elegance. And and he allowed me to use my more abstract poetic lyrics rather than his more conventional social realist lyrics. So um so we we you know a lot of people thought the skids were quite an arty band, which I never really thought. If I remember when the first time I ever met Bernard Summers properly and we were chatting. Because um, they did one of their first ever gigs supporting the Skids as a band called Warsaw in Manchester, and uh, they were terrible, I might add. And um, and then they played with us again uh, when we were on tour with the Stranglers, and I think as uh, you had been put in prison for uh, being caught with drugs, so I would do the Skids, and then I would go back on and do the Stranglers. Uh, it was a pretty amazing experience. And one of the gigs we did, uh, Joy Division, were the support band. So I got quite close to Ian because we, we we shared the same health condition. We're both, we, we were, well, he was epileptic. I still am. Um, I remember Bernard Summer saying to me, ah, you're, you're quite arty. And I was like quite taken aback because <laughs> I, I thought that's what they were, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but when we weren't, we were seen more as a much more straightforward post-punk band. But in fact, if you look at the Skids lyrics, some of the kind of way we used imagery with the band, then there is something else going on with the skids. You know, it's not a straightforward... I mean, I like straightforward music, I might add, but I think there's something else going on with the skids always. You know, you look at the lyrics and, and the way Stuart composed around the lyrics, there's definitely something else going on there that's a bit more interesting, I think. Well, I think that is the core to what uh, the genius of the skids, in a sense. It was, um, it was arty, but not in a pretentious way. This, this was... And this is probably the crux of everything you've always been about. This, this is art that you've somehow discovered all this stuff in a very unlikely place and created an aesthetic in a, in a place where you would not be allowed to even have that aesthetic in the 70s, would you? You know, like oh, the powers oh, yeah. of the, the schools you went to, this wasn't here yeah. for you. You had to find this through pop culture, didn't you? Indeed. I mean, I think it was dangerous. I mean, you know, to to be honest about things like like in poetry and I was very lucky because uh, I had an older brother, Francis, uh, who was a big inspiration to me as a kid. I shared the bedroom with him, and um, he was a really good artist. So on, in the room, he painted all the, the the Marvel heroes that I liked. I was a big fan of science fiction as a kid, and he introduced me to great writers, Isaac Asimov, John Wyndham, Brian Aldiss, all that stuff. So you're reading that very early. And, of course, I'm listening to the music he was listening to, which was really quite progressive avant-garde stuff, like Captain Beefheart, Frank Zappa, you know, Grateful Dead. But it was him that introduced me to things that really connected with me, um, which was 
like things like MC5 and and David Bowie. Um, but most of all, probably most importantly for me, was always Lou Reed because the poetry was so lush, you know, in his work that I just loved that. And there was something transgressive about the music. I didn't really understand that because I was so young, but I knew there was something else going on. And, and, and you know, I got all that from him. So I was very lucky as a young kid, I was listening to music, whereas my contemporary in the same area was probably listening to Slade and, you know, much more straightforward stuff. Um, and I mean, even when I was at school, that uh, when I got older, most of the guys in my school were listening to Genesis or Yes or Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And I absolutely categorically hated that music. You know, I hated it. Um, and I mean, I didn't just dislike it. I, I, I it made me feel like, you know, uh, it was quite tribal, you know, quite early on. So when punk rock happened, you were already there. You know, you was you were this kind of person that had already been on that same journey. As and then I look at the things that you know John Lydon was listening to. I mean, like even like Neu, the great German band from Dusseldorf. I mean, the song Hero. I knew that because my brother was a big Neu fan. And I love that song, Hallow Gallo and and um and Hero were two songs that I loved. I did I didn't realise they had long hair because when when I hear Hero, to me it sounds like a punk song. You know, it sounds like yeah. MC five or it sounds like the Stooges. It doesn't sound like a bunch of guys from long hair with long hair playing frog rock in Dusseldorf. Uh so you know, you can see that there was a something going on that when punk rock came along, you were already there. I mean, the first time I met Stuart was at a gig um, in Dunfermline where the Doctors of Madness were supporting Bebop Deluxe. He was there for Bebop Deluxe because he was a big Bill Nelson fan. I wasn't. I, mean, I didn't really like them very much. I was a Doctors of Madness fan. And and I loved the imagery. I liked the lyrics. I liked the science fiction thing about them. And, that, and that probably that's why I liked Alex Harvey so much because he was like a comic book kind of sci-fi character to me. Um, and so Stuart and I met, you know, really in a kind of contrapuntal way. He was there for this amazing guitar player called Bill Nelson. And um, and I was there for this image-based kind of uh, sci-fi experience with Doctors of Madness, you know. And, and I think that's where we connected because I brought in that aesthetic to the skids, stuff that was a little bit more progressive maybe and interesting but with a real dark edge to it and he brought in that beautiful guitar playing so you know that's what happens in bands don't you think that that people bring different elements if you even look at joy division i mean hookie in my mind could have been the bass player in a heavy metal band and probably might have been happier <laughs> in that genre uh, and i remember seeing them in uh, canto kino in berlin in uh, 1980 i think and I hung out with him afterwards and uh, Ian was the arty person. He's the one that brought the aesthetic. The other guys, you know, were kind of much more into straightforward punk. And so, you know, there's always there's elements where people bring different things to the table. And and uh, I think certainly with the skids, we kind of lucked out, really, because she was already a very accomplished guitar player when he was a young person. And I was already well on my way into the world of literature and film and poetry and stuff as a young guy that marked you out differently from the people around you. Not better, I don't mean better, just different. And also I had a health condition, I was epileptic, so that already marks you out as being different. You know, a lot of people, certainly in the neighbourhood I lived in, you know, thought it was almost like a medieval thing, you know, that 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 you were touched by the devil or something. So you, you tend to be a bit of a loner. Um, so therefore, if you're a loner, music becomes more and more important to you as does literature, because these are the two things that give you solace and guide you. And suddenly you're, you're reading what your heroes are reading. You're finding out that uh, Walking the Wild Side was taken from a Nelson Algren book of the same name. So suddenly you're reading that, you can get a hold of it, which was difficult. And then you go searching for all these other things. Boy kind of led me in a weird direction with things like um, Alistair Crowley, which I just thought was ridiculous and I didn't like at all. But that was during the station station era when he was being a bit mad. <laughs> My great uh, love of Boy really, I mean, I love Boy, but it, it's the it's the German trilogy that I love the most. You know, um, 
Low and Heroes and Lodger, just they were the three albums that ended up meaning the most to me, especially Low, which I just think is a modern masterpiece, as is Berlin by Lou Reed, which to this day remains my favourite album of all time. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that when I was being around in the talks about the golf book, because how important those Berlin records were, kind of setting the template really for post punk, the minimalism, the shivering darkness to them. They, they, it's, it's weird because they came out during punk and they should have sounded out of sync, but they, they, they were an escape route to a future, weren't they? they? They were, and they determined the future because, you know, I mean, for me personally, I think the new romantic thing slightly got in the way. Um, because that was a little bit superficial. And uh, it, I mean, I think Bob Elms once called it the cult with no name, and I wish I had stayed that way. Um, but I think Boy was always much better than that. You know, albums like Low and Heroes were just amazing. But Low remains. I mean, my first proper novel, The Speed of Life, was taken from that album. It's, there's a novel about two aliens coming to Earth in search of David Bowie looking for the meaning of creativity so you know that album remains one of the greats you listen to it today and you listen to Warzawa and you think wow it's still incredible that that album was made during that period when this was a guy who had hits but he had hits from that album you know um Sound and Vision was a hit you know people forget that you know he, that he turned a song like that into a into a hit um so it's pretty incredible but the, the, you're right the, these were the things that these were the game changers, which inspired people like, I think, Howard DeVoto to create magazine, um, you know, that album. Because to me, they, they were the first band that changed things, I think. You know, the magazine were the band that, like, you went, wow, you can really do something. And you can do something that's accomplished and elegant and sophisticated, and you don't have to join kind of the, the divide of shitty music. You can stay with, like, really cool music but do something better than what's expected of you because I remember when I heard real life for the first time I never really got down when I heard other people's great material because I think I, I hope you agree that one of the great things about punk was it wasn't competitive you know you you heard a album by somebody else and if you just loved it it was like yes you know it was a very <laughs> exciting thing like when you hear the first television album or um, real life these these were albums, that, the first Banshees album, you know, these were like, wow, you know, these people are really trying to do stuff and uh, and had the bravery to, to see it through. So, you know, Magazine, I think, don't get enough credit for being the band that, but specifically that album just went like, this is what you can really do. And, and, and made us up our game, you know, as the skids, we started to really think about it and, and the way John McGeat played guitar, you know, and John obviously was a very close friend of mine, uh, uh, that you start to think, my God, because John could play anything, you know, John could play heavy metal, progressive jazz. He could do the lot. If you said to him, could you play the guitar solo that Jimmy Page does in Stairway to Heaven? Boom, he could do it like that. But then you think mm -hmm. about the simplicity of his guitar riffs in things like uh, The Light Pours Out of Me or something. You know, it's just so simple. And that's stuff that he eventually he, he tried to replicate in the Armoury show, unfortunately for us, unsuccessfully, because the Armoury show didn't really work. Well, I, I actually disagree. I think the Armoury show did work. I think the audience didn't work. <laughs> well, like that's very kind of right you. I think I'm, yeah. The I right think record had, in the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, if he had had... Um, if we had had more opportunities to do more material and let it evolve, I think it probably would have worked in the end. But John, John had already been enticed with the trinkets of life, you know, and he'd had great success with the Banshees and and then a Visage and made a lot of money. And, and he wanted, he thought me, him and the other guys would have instantaneously done it. But it was it was going to be tougher, you know. It was going to be a much longer slog because what we were offering wasn't as commercial, say, as big countries' music, which was pretty much straightforward rock music with a Scottish twist. And you know, they found their audience almost immediately with that music, whereas we were trying to do something a, a little bit more. I don't know. I think a bit more interesting. I think was it was there a sense of competition with you in big country? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, 
no, I don't think so. I mean, there, there was in the sense that um, the, the, they were very successful and we weren't commercially, but not really, because how can you compare the music of the Armoury show to the music of Big Country? It's just like that that shows you what was going on with Skids, really, because you've got Stuart doing this much more kind of dual guitar, kind of Scottish landscapey type of stuff. And then in the Armoury show, you've got me doing this very internalised, quite dark stuff, which the whole album is really about my girlfriend committing suicide in Berlin. So, you know, if you look at the lyrics, that's what they're about. Um, so, you know, it's a very different kind of vibe, I think, you know, and, uh, and uh, to me, the, the, when I play the Armoury show music to this day, things like Waiting for the Floods or The Glory of Love, they really still work, John. I mean, they've still got a vibrancy and edge and a darkness and and they've got an emotional quality that I really love and it, it, they have a power still. So, um, yeah, that music lives on. In fact, we're doing a new album as we speak and we've got a working title for it. It's Harry Dean Stanton is the working title of it. Mm. We've got about four or five songs in the bag. It's got a bit of a noy feel about it at the moment, um, which I love. Um Big fan of Dusseldorf, as you know. So, um, uh, so there's, there's, yeah, I think it's going to be a good album. I'm, I'm you know, uh, after the success of the Skids album, we're all in a bit of shock. You know, that Destination Dusseldorf really seemed to capture people's imagination, which really surprised me. And I don't mean that in a fake, humble way. I just mean I didn't see it coming. You know, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's got some nice things on it, but um, I didn't really see what happened with I, I couldn't see that happening because it's been a big big success I mean backtracking a little bit when you were working with Stuart did you bring things out of each other you know you say like Stuart you know he, he had his thing and you had your thing and there's a perfect balance in that but after a few months working together was the things he brought out of you and you brought out of him even subconsciously um well first of all he got used to working with lyrics that didn't have choruses so like off one skin for example and I wanted the the guitar to be the chorus, to create a, a riff that was the chorus. And so that was one of the first, I think that was the first song we ever wrote using my lyrics. Uh, so we were moving in a different direction there. And then we started to use things like the sense of coming um, was much more, in one sense, traditional, but the lyrics are not. And I've got that. I was brought up in the Catholic church, so a lot of my stuff have got a kind of hymn-like quality to them. And um, which, you know, I look back on the charts and I think, God, what the hell was that all about? But <laughs> but the actual musical part of it, the cultural part of it, has obviously left something with me. And so you, a lot of the anthemic stuff that we did, that came from me and he liked that. I mean, Into the Valley was originally called Depersonalized, which is a perfect term for what the song's about. But actually, it's a terrible title, you know. I mean, it's... Uh, but Into the Valley is a great title. So, um, <laughs> and, you know, so we, we st- I, he started to mould me more into the world of choruses. And, you know, he loved the lyrics of Masquerade. If you could, uh, I mean, we've got a reference to Guernica in that song. You know, it's such great. You're 17 years old and you're talking about the Spanish <laughs> Civil War and a Picasso painting in your song. I mean, it's not bad. But it was him that encouraged me to create the chorus of Masquerade in it. So... So he brought that out in me and, and I brought something out in him that I think he would never have done, which was looking to, you know, create something that was a little darker because his songs weren't so dark. And um, if you look at songs like Arena on the Absolute Game, that kind of thing, Dulce on um, Days in Europa. And he was also very keen to allow me to do more expressive spoken word stuff, you know, which... And we've done again on Destination Dusseldorf. I wrote a song with Hugh Cornwall of the ex of the Stranglers, and uh, it's about Berlin again. And it's called "The Things We've Seen," but we turned it into a spoken word song, and you know, and it really works. It's I, I love that that we can still at least afford ourselves the the ability and right to try something a little bit more experimental. Because the kids were always a wee bit experimental. We used to use the John Peel sessions as the way to be really experimental. Um, because we felt we were free in those sessions and John allowed you to do whatever you wanted. Uh, So there was always a wee bit of that going on anyway. And I think I brought that out to Stuart and Stuart 
brought out a more commercial side to me that I didn't have, but she stayed with me because I, I like choruses now. I understand that they're an important part of a song. I mean, when, when you were presenting Stuart with lyrics, I mean, I, I imagine this is a two-way process. Sometimes he would have written a song and you, you know, do the lyrics to that piece of music. And sometimes you present the lyrics to him and he create the music around it. Would you present the vocal melody with those lyrics as well? Yeah, or, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I did, um, for example, Into the Valley, I actually wrote on the piano and I gave it to him as a, as a tune and he moulded it into what it became. And also, I think the sense of coming, same thing, because I, I like to tinkle on the piano and um, and would give him something like that. It was only later that Stuart encouraged me to play guitar, which on the Absolute Game Tour, the last tour we ever did, and I absolutely hated it. I hated playing guitar because uh, I like the freedom of just doing what I want and being able to express yourself physically. And the guitar really locked me down, I thought. So for that last tour, the last tour we ever did, I remember the last night of that tour was in, Hammersmith Odeon in, in London, which is an iconic gig, of course. And uh, and I just felt so captured with, with this Stratocaster wrapped around me. And, and you know, I hate it. So I, I was determined when we started the Armoury show that I would never, ever play guitar again. Although McGee did want me to play guitar. Uh, so just talk about... Um how you, you you know, you and Stuart pull certain things out of each other and your sort of difficult musical backgrounds and how that creates sort of a very good balance in the initial group. But yeah. it was a, and there's a sense of that from the very first, it? because, you know, when you met, he could see something in you that he needed to create his musical project because he was actually his band when you went to join his yeah. band in the first place as, yeah, as no, a 15-year-old, he... <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was uh, he was he was the guy. I mean, he he already had a band where he went out and did cover versions all over Scotland, and he was really a very accomplished guitar player from a, a very early age. So you know, when when we got together, I was working with a guy who was already kind of a high level because a lot of people when they join punk bands, you know, they kind of you didn't have to be that good a player because it didn't matter because we. You know, the genuine punk bands that we used to go and see in Scotland, and there weren't many. I mean, the Skids were one of the first, if not the first. Uh, there was a band called The Jolt and um, a few others. But the other bands were much older, and they were R&B bands, you know, kind of almost like the pub scene in London. Um, so they were quite good players, but they played in a very particular way. Stuart was like this new thing, you know. He was this young guy. He looked a bit like Sid Vicious. And um, he could really, really play. And I think the title track of the first album, Scared to Dance, really confirms that. You know, he's got a very beautiful guitar line in it. I mean, I, I, I hated guitar solos, but, you know, the guitar line, I would, as I would like to call it, was much more about the atmosphere of the song. And I think that's something that he learned from me was that songs could have a structure, but they must have an atmosphere. And the atmosphere could come from the way that we performed them so it wasn't just about writing a song it's like um how are we going to perform this live and this to this day that's still something that i think about you know that you 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 go on the stage to perform you do you don't go on the stage to play the songs because who cares do you know what i mean you've got to go in there and perform them or do something that makes people feel that it's a different experience to that and i always prefer the live experience to the been in the studio because I hate I hated being in the studio. It wasn't my thing. Um, I wasn't as accomplished a musician as the other guys. As I say, I played a little bit of piano and eventually guitar. Neither of which I liked doing, to be honest with you. So um, uh, it was it was difficult for me being in the studio. The worst experience I ever had in the studio was the Armory Show album, because all those guys in that band were amazing musicians, but they were really indulgent. You know, it's like so boring. They were just like. <laughs> working on drum sounds for a week, you know, like, fuck off. You know, yeah. like, drums are the drums, you know what I mean? Just it's there to keep rhythm and accentuate elements of the lyrics, I always think. That's why I used to love um, the drummer from The Who, because he would follow, he wouldn't follow the bass lines or he wouldn't follow Pete Townsend. He followed Roger Daltrey, you know, and, and so he accentuated what Daltrey was doing with some of those uh, lyrics. And that's what I thought punk was about, you know, that the, the drums kind of followed the, the the singer rather than the bass player. But 
as as these musicians, John, got better and better, and certainly by the time I was working in the Armory show, these guys were highly accomplished people. McGeeat was probably the king of the castle in those days. You know, everyone looked up to him quite rightly uh, as a guitar player. As a human being, unfortunately, he had fallen into, you know, um, all of these vulnerabilities and weaknesses came to fruition, uh, unfortunately for me. But they were really, really seriously accomplished players, which I actually didn't give a shit about. It really yeah. pissed me off because they'd be sitting talking about inverted chords and something. I'm like, <laughs> bullshit. Does it have the atmosphere? You know, and... Um, and that's something that's very, very important to me, atmosphere, you know, in a song. And I mean, I know one of the songs on there, we just we just finished the tour of um, promoting the album and we went in a song called Here We Go Again. We we, we delved into Walking the Wild Side and, and it was just a very beautiful moment because it's so much atmos- atmosphere and everybody knows that song. But a lot of people have never really thought about the lyrics because the lyrics are so transgressive, aren't they? Yeah, and, um, yeah. Um, and you're singing, and I, I've taken the two verses from it and really highlighted it. And, and you can see people's faces in the audience going, shit, that's about a, a, a trans, transvestite giving a guy a blowjob. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's almost like they've never thought about it before. You know, <laughs> it's almost like those DJs in the 70s who played it on Radio 1 without ever actually thinking about what the lyrics <laughs> yeah. were saying. It's yeah. hilarious. Um, uh, so... You know, it's that that's about atmosphere, isn't it? And creating atmosphere in the song, and and I liked that. And I think that a lot of the bands that I liked um, were bands that you know, I mean, like I'm a big fan of Killing Joke or Joy Division, um, say for example, Banshees, Television. These bands created atmosphere. You know, it was much more about the atmosphere than it was about the song itself. It was the songs, if you strip down ceremony. It's only got two chords, you know, F and C, and but what a song! I mean, what a song! That song. I mean, to me, one of my favorite songs ever written. That ceremony. The lyrics are sensational. Um, the bass line is one of the great bass lines of all time, I think. And it's only two chords, John. So, and and they're two major chords, F and C. You know, so you know all that bullshit about inverted chords. Just, I just like sometimes I got who cares. <laughs> yeah. you know, because if you look at some of the great songs, you know, some of my favourite songs anyway, they were written with a kind of absolute sense of simplicity um, because it was really about finding something to give the words a platform. And and uh, I think eventually the skids did do that. You know, I think my, my words got a lot of abuse over the years, um, <laughs> being a bit pretentious and... You know who the who the fuck do you think you are as a sixteen year old kid writing about Guernica or putting all these kind of obscure references, having Jean Paul's art quotes on the back of your album? I mean, people really annoyed them, and I was thinking, well, that's all right because that's what punk's about, isn't it? It's about annoying people and irritating them, and and being sixteen years old in a band that's just recorded an album and having Jean Paul's art on the back of it. To me, that was exactly the point. You know, I think you okay. said earlier. It was an accumulation of all those things, and boom, there you have this opportunity through pop culture to make the all to make them all make sense, like science fiction, transgressive music from Blue Reed, um, kind of the glamour of David Bowie, or that subterranean world he created in Law, and you you bring all that into the play, and suddenly you you find a voice for yourself, you know, and and it was a magical, magical time. And I think just before we got cut off, I, I was saying that one of the things I loved about that era was it wasn't competitive. You know, I, I, I can't remember ever slagging off another band. I mean, I never, this wasn't really something I thought about, you know, and I loved other bands. I, I mean, probably every night of the week, I'd go and see a band every night of the week because the idea of not going was even worse. You know, yeah. one night it would be Elvis Costello and then the next night it would be the Dickies from America, and then the next night it would be The Damned, and then the next night it would be Penetration, and then the next night it would be a local band, you know, just playing in a bar who, who've only got three songs. I never went and saw shit bands, I can tell you that for nothing. Hmm. Because I've never been a member of the music club at my school, and uh, 
I went to a Catholic school called St Columbus and they had a music club and they would take us to concerts and they would take us to see Bartley, Bartley James Harvest. And, and, you know, I just knew walking into the place, it's like, this is not for me. I was very close with a guy called Budgie. He was my mate. And uh, he's a bit older than me, but we were massive. Uh, he was a massive uh, Alex Harvey fan. And we went along to see Alex Harvey. We were both skinheads at the time. We had our crumbies on, white stay press, cherry red Doc Martens with yellow laces, great haircut. And we went to see Alex Harvey. He was supporting Mott the Hoople. And, um, you know, all the Mott the Hoople fans like, were looking at these two skinheads. He's Because we were tiny. We were just little guys. And they were kind of like, what the hell is that doing here? But then when Alex came on and did Vamble, they were like, yes, what a <laughs> performance. And then when Mott the Hoople came on, I was like, oh, no. Although, I might add, I, I have a tremendous respect for Ian Hunter as a lyricist. And... I just didn't really like glam rock very much. You know, it was a bit stupid with Ariel Bender coming on with a white suit with wings coming out the back. Just like, nah, it's, that's just not for me. Um, <laughs> but Alex Harvey certainly was. I even though, you know, weirdly enough, I wasn't such a fan of Alex's music. It was a bit frog rock. But the 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 atmosphere, again, of it was just like, yes, you know, this, this kind of violent science fiction kind of grunge punk world that he created before punk even existed. And this tough Glaswegian guy, you know, he was, he was amazing, amazing performer. Loved him. Do you, do you think that's the singer's role, is to create that atmosphere, to make sense of the inverted chords or whatever, you know, to, uh, to, to create this atmosphere and sense of performance that you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. And, I mean... I think the last tour of the skids, I think we had a lot of that atmosphere in the the, the presentation of the songs. Now, when we play now, I've taken it in a slightly different direction. It's much more of a force of nature. It's a physical experience that wraps itself around you. I've kept myself strong and fit and stuff, you know, and uh, I can I can still bounce around. And it's a real, it just comes at you. But what I decided to do, which is different from a lot of different, uh, from a lot of other bands, is... I've had a bit of a journey in life, you know, and it's been, it's some of it's been incredible and some of it's been absolutely terrible and some of it's been joyous and some of it's been really tragic. Uh, so I've got a lot of stories to tell. And when I found out that I was going out and do these acoustic or book events, I've got lots of stories to tell and I've, I've done some with you and it's great fun, you know, you can tell these stories. And I wondered if I could do it live at a high-powered electric gig, you know, with the full force of nature there. And everybody told me it would never work because people don't want to hear that, but it does work. Um, because you, essentially you've taken the piss out of yourself, which I think in the UK people really like. <laughs> um, and secondly, it's giving, you, giving people an insight into a world that they thought they knew, but they didn't really know. So... I tell stories about driving down from Scotland in the winter on a 125 motorcycle to buy a pair of leather trousers when I was 15. I'm on the back of a motorbike with my mate. We had no insurance. I don't think he had a license. And then we meet Sid Vicious and we go and see Sid playing drums for Susie and the Banshees. And Sid becomes a pal and looks after us. And, you know, so so we were really there, you know. And, and I've always been a little bit shy of telling those stories or you know, Steve Jones of the Pistols was a very, very close friend of mine. And we got up to a lot of mischief, or he did. <laughs> Obviously, he's a accomplice and um, often really kind of a bit nervous and if not a bit embarrassed by his behaviour. Um, <laughs> but they're great stories, you know, and I think, I don't, at first I thought maybe people think it's going to be really pompous, me saying, oh, these are all my mates. But in fact, it's not like that. I tell funny stories about our time together and they're connected to the songs in some way or other. And also talk about that weird period in the 70s where, you know, you're on a TV show, the biggest TV show in the in the UK, Top of the Pops, and you're being introduced by Jimmy Savile or Dave Lee Travis or some creepy man, you know? So just explaining and, and talking about what that was like for the time, you know? So I think people, I mean, listen, there'll be lots, there will be other people who don't like it, but I, seem, I get the, the feeling that people kind of think it's fun you know and it's uh it's a, just a different way of doing it you know and it works for me you know it really works for me that way so i'm going to keep at that 
I mean, when, when you were 15, 16 and you gate crashed literally the middle of the, you know, the inner circle of the London punk scene, I mean, what was that like? Was it like a disappointment or was it, I mean, you in your head, you always think it's going to be one thing, but in reality, it's another. Or was it, it was, as, as much yeah, fun no, as you thought it was going to be? Yeah. No, it was completely the opposite. It was amazing. It was completely amazing experience. And uh, as you say, I was 15 when I went down to get my leather trousers made in Beaufort Market. And, and down the King's Road, and then we walked across the road to Malcolm's shop and met Sid. And uh, uh, another woman there was called Jordan, we met her. And then through Sid, I met Sid, Steve Severin, who I ended up sharing a flat with for five years, you know, and um, and became very close to Susie, um, obviously. And we, we had a rich, rich friendship. And through Severin and Susie, I met people that maybe I would never have met, you know, because they're from a different side of the story, you know, probably like with the flat we had. Um, I was reading about the flat actually in um, Bobby Gillespie's book, Tenement Kid, and he talks about the flat coming there a lot because um, Severin um, produced also images when he was involved with them. And he was he talked about going to that flat and it was an amazing flat because it was like where the action was, was in our place. And so every week we'd have a party there. And uh, the people I met was amazing there. You know, we, I mean, you know, you'd be, Jim Jarmusch would be sitting on the sofa next to Nick Cave. And then, mm. you know, we had a garden area. And, you know, you saw the people that were out there, Lydia Lunch, you know, um, I don't know, Richard Hell. It was incredible. It was an incredible place. And I don't think I would have, got into that circle that wasn't from the fact that I shared the place with Steve. Steve is a great flatmate. We had a lot of fun together. I mean, he's a very serious guy, obviously, but he's also very mischievous and a great <laughs> sense of humour. He was much crueler about other people's music than I was <laughs> um, uh, and much more cynical because I'm not a cynic. So uh, so I had to sometimes you'd say, where are you going to tonight? I go, oh, I'm just going to go and see some people, blah, blah, blah. But I'd be going off to see something like the undertones or something, and he wouldn't approve of that. Because he'd be thinking, <laughs> ah, that's, you should stick with, you know, the kind of, the darker side, you know, and, and uh, what, what I, I guess that you just said in your uh, wonderful book is sometimes become homogenized into the world of goth. Everything's called goth. And you can see the antecedents and the genesis of how that became. But some of the acts weren't quite that you know they were just interested in the dark side and um because yeah. that's where we come from you know if you think about Lou Reed and Bowie and Iggy and stuff it's the dark side you know uh, so it was in all of us um but I had a lot of fun in that flat five years of just incredible fun and um I've got so many stories to tell from that era what we did. I could probably write a book about it, John, just just from the flat alone, that flat. Because it, be like, it would be a great book, almost like you know, the classic sitcoms are set in one room. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, it is that. Yeah, I remember Susie used to always say, uh, because she lived in South London, she would say, oh, I'm going to stay over tonight. Is that okay? And can I sleep on the sofa? And I go, No, no, you have my bed and I'll sleep on the sofa. And she said, That doesn't give you a passport to come into the room. I mean, absolutely not. <laughs> And, and she would do that a lot, you know, they would have a party and three or four in the morning, she would say, oh, I'm just going to stay over. And I'd always, and as a gentleman, John, say, have my room, I'll sleep on the sofa. Because Severin was always with um, some different girl. He was a bit of a, a bit of a one. And anyway, I remember the night she said to me, oh, they called me Jobo. That was my name. Steve, Steve um, Jones created that name, Jobo. And he said, um, <laughs> Can I, uh, is it okay for me and Budgie to have your room tonight? And I went, fuck off. Budgie, no, no chance. I didn't know they were having a scene then. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 absolutely not. That's not happening. Because, of course, she was, uh, you know, she was the kind of fetish of all of us, you know, Susie. Um, but I always had such fun with her, a lot of laughs. And, um, um, yeah. I mean, as someone, as someone like you were much younger, you were two, three, four years younger than a lot yeah. of these people. Uh, these are very London, very very inner circle. I mean, did you feel in awe of them, or did you feel like an equal? And did they treat you like an equal as well? I, I, I was I was a little bit in awe of the banshees, I must say. Um, and but then I was part of their inner circle because I was part of their family because I shared the flat with Severin, and they were in the flat all the time. Uh, they was in West Hampstead, 
Um, and then I was friends with Steve, and that was friends with Sid, you know. And whatever you hear about Sid, you know, and some of it obviously is true, he's a bit of an asshole and all that, but I've got to say, he was very kind and nice to me, and he was a good laugh. And and so that's my memory of him. You know, my memory is not this asshole with her. I mean, I met him, I met her and him together. I've got a photograph in my house of them together, which I love the picture. I was there at the time, it was a press thing they were doing, and my friend Steve Emberton took the picture of them, and it's a really great picture. So, you know, my memory of him is a really, is a, like, he's very sweet, you know, he's a sweet mm. guy. Um, so when people say all these things, oh, what an asshole he was, I go, well, that's not the guy I recognise. And the only person I never got on with was Lydon, really, and uh, and we would never get on. We were, you know, he was just such a self-righteous prick. And um, the day that he <laughs> stole the gear for me from for Pill, I'll never forgive him for that day, you know, just because we were starting to think about our second album and that would be the album that would have broke the Armoury show, I think. And and then John got the offer from Leiden to join Pill and he jumped at it. So, and, he, and you know, John was used to playing stadiums and playing big venues and with the Armoury show, we were playing small clubs again, John. You know, we were out there playing in places like Blackburn and Wigan and, you know, I don't know, um, Gateshead and places that are not on the big circuit but are on the smaller circuit. I had no problem with that. But I think with with McGee, he'd been so used to playing big stadiums with the Banshees and they had the success of Visage, of course, that... He wanted back. He wanted that back. You know, he wanted to play the big, the big venues again. Of course, we clearly walked straight into that, into a big band. You know, listen, I don't like Lydon, but I like Pill. I mean, the first Pill album is mm. one of the most iconic albums ever made. You know, it's absolutely incredible, and and as is the second album, and kind of it ends there for me personally. But those first two albums, wow, they were amazing, absolutely amazing. Oh, they- you need to give her flowers and romance a few more listens. It's it's a great record. Yeah, I think I'm being unfair. I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. I think that's also a great album. Um, but you know, like I say, I keep on saying, and um, I don't want to bore you with repeating myself, but you know that that period wasn't competitive. You weren't hanging out with all those people thinking they're better than me in band terms. We we're just different. I mean, I'd go and see the Banshees a lot playing live, but the Banshees wouldn't come and see the Skids. Severin did. Severin did actually, and he was a he was quite fond of the skids, but Susie wasn't, and um, she, it just wasn't for her. Do you know what I mean? She saw it more of a a lads thing, which it wasn't. You know, um, but I don't think we were a lads band. But I think it was the sing along choruses that we had. She saw that as a bit footbally, and um, and you know that's kind of turned her off it a little bit. You know, but but it wasn't like in a nasty way, you know. Um, mm. But as I say, those guys, those guys were much more cynical than I was. I mean, geez, honestly, yeah. <laughs> I, even the album, we had this. Um, me and Steve had the most amazing vinyl collection, and I'd listened to uh, Brian Eno had arrived on the scene, you know, with all the ambient music, and you were listening to um, music for film, music for airports. They were just amazing albums. So music for airports, especially, it's just like wow. And he used to kind of go, ah, oh, get this shit off. And, uh, you know, he, he, his stuff was kind of a really quite left field music that he would listen to and movies because we spent a lot of time watching movies in that flat and uh, watching really kind of seriously left field movies like Tarkovsky, the great Russian director, or movies that had escaped out of Eastern Europe that were a little bit more inventive or, um, American indie films, you know, and so, he, you know, it was a great, it was a great time for that. I think, you know, literature, movies, and music were all completely linked together in a a really beautiful way. I think. But they are for you as well, aren't they? And going back to the idea of the theatricality in the performance, that really being in a band is is a way is a way for you to sort of demonstrate that. But it, but in a sense, you're not really a singer, are you? You're just somebody who's got an artful drive. And the only available art form at that time in the mid to late seventies available to you would be a rock and roll band. But you could, I guess, I guess even at that time, I know you eventually do it, but you could have easily been an actor if that was possible for where you came from, or a writer, or you could have been like uh, one of your compatriots from a uh, five, like Ian Rankin as well, who you actually knew at that time, couldn't you? you know, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I think I'd, I'd rewind it slightly and say there was something else going on with me because I've already said I had this health condition, which um, is epilepsy. And it had a really major impact on the way I saw the world. So without being overly melodramatic or sentimental, I started to get this kind of sense that I ain't going to be around for long. And so when you're my age, 15, and you're thinking I ain't going to be around for long because I was so sick, I had this thing of just had to absolutely squeeze the juice out of it every, every day. So I used to drive Stuart Adamson mad because he would say, yeah. can't you just concentrate on this or why are you going to live in Berlin or all this kind of stuff? But the reason being for me was it was more about the fact that I didn't expect I genuinely didn't expect to make 21, for example. I thought that was, a, I mean, imagine imagine surviving till you're 20. That's what was going on in my head. So you've got this fairly existential thing going on permanently. Um, and, you know, I was ill during that period a lot. I mean, so something I don't really talk about much, but I was really sick. Um, which is, in a funny kind of way, is the thing that saved me because I didn't get really involved with the drugs or the booze so much. Um, for everybody around me, it was like cocaine was an epidemic by that time, by 1980. I'd come out of the epidemic of heroin in Scotland and managed to bypass both of them because my feeling was well, if, I'm, if I'm having to take 300 milligrams of phenytoin every day just to try and stop me having a seizure, why the hell would I want to take cocaine or heroin, you know, so, or even alcohol? And so, um, Weirdly enough, it's the the thing that damned me is the thing that kind of almost in a weird way saved me. Um, so I had this kind of sense that I ain't going to be around for long. And I know that sounds ridiculous now, but that's how I felt. And so therefore I had to squeeze the juice out of every day. So if somebody said, do you want to come and read poetry in Brussels alongside William Burroughs? I'm on the plane. You know, I'm coming. <clears throat> and, and do you want to come and support Joy Division in Antwerp? I'm on the plane, you know, on my own, just reading poetry and at these events. And and uh, then you find yourself touring with William Burroughs in Europe. You know, it's like mental. He wasn't a very nice guy in my head. He was a total shit. But, um, <laughs> but still, I did it. And, and then you're suddenly, at the age of 18, you're living in Berlin, 25 metres from the wall in Mantufelstrasse in Kreuzberg. And this other world, you know, you're thinking, my God, what am I doing here? And it was amazing, amazing experience. So all of these things were driven by the fact that if you don't squeeze the juice out of every day, um, the days are going to be taken away from you. Well, that's not happened, you know, because I'm still here. I'm, I feel pretty good. I feel pretty healthy and strong. I'm 63 next week, you know, so um, I feel good for it. Um, but at that time, it was really a case of... And that feral quality that, that drives used to drive you were the, one of the things you asked me is what did the other people think of me i mean i think when i was with the clash guys like joe especially i think i, I intimidated him a little bit because you're full of this kind of you know i've got to get going with life and this energy and probably a little bit aggressive about it and of course you're like when, when i'm with him i was 16 He's like, he's a man, you know, and you're thinking, what the hell is this kid? Sid used to say that to me. He goes like, you know, you're the, you're the real thing. You know, you're this little kid coming from nowhere, you know, and here you are down here on the back of a motorbike to buy leather trousers and, and, and you're 15 and you're like, he's laughing. Do you know what I mean? Because he said, you're the real thing. You're the punk. <laughs> and then, because, you know, I remember meeting him, I was with the, um, Hugh Cornwall, who's still a very close friend of mine, and and he was he said, Sid said to me, "What are you doing with these old guys? Don't, you don't hang out with them." But I knew to keep clear, Sid, then because the drugs were pretty serious, you know. So, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Funnily enough, I matured with the Stranglers. In Scottish law, you couldn't be a professional performer till you were eighteen. Obviously, I was far too young, and we're touring with the Stranglers, so we. Uh, the Scottish law said that you have to take a mentor on tour with you who's a, also teaching you stuff, you know, and I was like, well, that ain't going to happen. And and then Hugh stood and said, well, I used to teach uh, history and English. So so he put me, he put him down on the paper uh, as my mentor. So I had to go to his room every night on the tour to be taught English, history and geography, believe it or not. 
I've got to tell you, man, you know, I touched those subjects once, but I had to, <laughs> I had to officially clock into his room for, for the legal aspect of it. And their manager, Ian Grant, used to laugh his head off. He'd, he'd go, right. So in you go. And he said, he used to say, you can come straight back out again. I've got some no chance. I'm staying. Because <laughs> it, like, <laughs> it was like, it was quite active. Uh, <laughs> And you were only a kid, you know, but I learned a lot of stuff from you, but certainly not geography or history. Or <laughs> uh, it was great, great fun. And that, that was kind of weird, right? Because I was just, I, I don't really think about it, John, but I was really young when I was uh, there. And the, the only people, I remember meeting the guy, I mean, Andy Blade from Eater. And um, and I loved that Roxy album that they were on. And I remember meeting Andy and it's like, we were the kind of same age, you know, like, like they were still at school, I think, when they did that album. And it was weird being with people your own age, because everybody else was much older, you know what I mean? Where, um, and you had to try and not be a twat. And I was a twat, because <laughs> not very experienced, not very sophisticated. And some of the people in and around the punk thing were, you know, been at university and were very smart, you know, under, understood what postmodernism was. And and you were striving to learn what postmodernism was in your own way, uh, in a kind of autodidactic kind of way. Um, and and those kind of people I didn't really like very much. I never really took to people like John Savage, the the journalist writer, because he always made me feel like I was a bit of a twat and not up to his standards, which I thought was deeply patronising. And and you know, and I always supported bands like. Um, the Angelic Upstarts, for example, in Menzi, because I liked his politics, I liked him very much. And I just thought they actually, in many ways, are a real punk band, you know, coming from where they come from in Sunderland, um, the tough life they've had, and they've still kept this pure sense of how the world could be in their songs. And the music wasn't the greatest music, but there was something about them that I supported, and that used to irritate those people, because they were all saying, oh, that's all fucking regional shit. And I was going, like, no, no, it's not. You know, it's it might not be what you think it should be, like Joy Division or something, you know, but it's it's to me it's as important, you know, that as those bands. Um, yeah, so it, I, you know, Paul Morley, I got on with okay because he came to the Banshees a lot and would be in the flat a lot. So we had an okay relationship. We don't now, actually, weirdly enough. I don't know what happened there because. I met him at the Pete Shelley Memorial gig at the Albert Hall, which we played, obviously. And he was a bit weird with me, but like, life's too short, John. Do you know what I mean? It's too mm-hmm. short. I always admired his writing, and um, he did some beautiful pieces on some great music that came out in Manchester, uh, essentially. And Manchester was some place, you know. I mean, the skids went to Manchester before we played in London, and and I'll never forget it. It was amazing. We played in Rafters. Um, they were called the Rizillos then, not the Rivillos, the Rizillos, and then it was mm. us, and then Warsawa, you know, with uh, who were the who were Joy Division before Joy Division, and then that evening we played in a club called the Ranch, which was near Piccadilly, with a band called Slaughter and the Dogs, who I loved because I, I had their single um, "Fear of All the Boot Boys" gone, which I loved that song, and um, I also met a guy there that night who became a friend uh, called Vinnie Riley, this kind of very elegant. Slight, slightly melancholic character who I ended up doing lots of work with, with Crepe School, the Belgian label, and with him performing with me and stuff. So I met a lot of people. I love Manchester very much. It was a special, it still is a very special place. I like cities in the UK that are have their own identity. They don't try and copy London, because how can you? London's huge, you know, it's, you can't copy London. But they have their own scene. Think of the stuff that came out in Manchester then, you know, from the Buzzcocks, um, uh, then on to, you know, magazine. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. You know, Buzz, the Buzzcocks were amazing. I mean, what an amazing band. And then the Smiths. The Smiths were incredible. You know, I mean, they were an amazing band, the Smiths. I think I mean, it, so- in, a, in a sense, those people are very similar to you. They're in a big city, but that thing they were on the outside, but somehow found this culture. And I think what you kind of represent is a very positive spirit from punk, that everything was possible. You could try everything. You could embrace everything. You could be anything you wanted. And the more snobby people kind of looking down on you, they got it all completely wrong, I think. I, I think so. I totally agree with you. I mean, I've read John's book, 
England's Dreaming and it's an okay book and all that. He's a good writer. There's no two ways about that. But, I mean, to him, the greatest pop cultural achievement of the last 30 years or more, sorry, 40 years, is, is the Pet Shop Boys. And you go like, are you having a laugh? You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, I think they've got their place and they were, you know, they were great observers of a, a, a world. But come on, for God's sake. Um, so, and there's a snobber. See, the thing is that they defined the history of this thing we were talking about. They've defined it because they're, they're the arbiters of, you know, this is how it's going to be seen. And in fact, when you get to meet people like myself, who was there and in amongst it as a kid, and you're hanging out with, you know, Seth or Steve Jones or Steve Seven or Susie and making all these new friends in life, you were in it. And, mm. and I look at his stuff and I go, you weren't in it. You weren't there. You were never there. And so it's a mm. it's a very kind of, he talks, he almost reads it, reads subjective, but it's objective because he wasn't there. He was there much, much later. And, and as I say, uh, he looked down his nose at the kind of feral kind of street urchin thing that we had that he could never have, you know, and um, and he, he, so he's redesigned the story. And unfortunately, that is now the story. So when people, I listen to them on the radio and they're talking about that era and, and they, they, they talk that, you're one of the few people who's kind of, realigned it by going and saying wait a minute these bands were happening and they were doing stuff and you know and there was lots of important stuff happening in different pockets all over the place that mm. have just been completely forgotten or written out in the story because it doesn't suit the story and that's what happens with history right but thank god for what you've been doing because you're going like no no wait a minute and you know so um and, and i think realigning it in a, in a way that's very positive I sometimes look at those books and I read them and I'm just, just go like, wow, wait a minute, you know that's not what happened, and you weren't there, and and well, it's, you know, it's it's annoying at skids because you don't even get counted to Scottish music history. They make films about Scottish post punk, and you're not and even not, in there. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and <laughs> they, I mean, it's essentially yeah. about um, orange juice or something. And you go like, yeah, but they weren't there. I did a radio show um, with Edwin before he got ill. And and they were talking about asking him about what that punk period was like. And I was sitting on I was on it was on a phone link, I was sitting listening to this stuff. And then he stopped and he said, Well, to be to, to be perfectly honest with you, maybe you should ask Richard, because he was there. I wasn't there. <laughs> he was there. You know what I mean? The skids were there. That guy was down in London hanging out with all of those bands. You know, we played with the Clash, we played with the Buzzcocks, we played with Every band from that era, we played with them. Uh, and um, and suddenly, you know, there's not any bitterness about it. It's just the way that history is written to, in a convenient way to suit the, the writer, John. And mm -hmm. I feel sorry. I don't feel sorry for myself because the skids have got their place. There's no two ways about that. But, you know, I think people like Menzies from Angelic Cup Stars, I just feel a little bit sorry, really, that they've not, been given a place. I mean, you know, they deserve, you know, because of where they came from and who they are and what they had tried to achieve. And I've got a great admiration for their politics. You know, I mean, he was he was an anti-fascist in an era where the fascists were all around you, you know, and he was a brave guy. And I remember I used to talk to him about it. We were out there, you know, not the skinheads that we liked, the bad ones, and just ready to fight them, you know, and um, and we shared that in common. I liked him. I admired him and respected him. And I think he's not, he's not being, the, he's just one of many, many stories that have been all but ignored. I know you don't ignore them, but you understand what I'm trying to say about this. You know, there's a kind of pomposity about it that I own the genre. I own punk rock. I own the Shut up. You know yeah, I mean? no, nobody owns it, do they? Um, so so now, uh, now you're older. We talk about the youthful riches. So is, is it, you know, the way you make music now, the way you create, the way you think about your creativity, has it changed, you know, now in the, uh, you know, in the uh, let's say, the final chapters? <laughs> I think it certainly is the final chapter. I mean, I'm on the home straight now. Yeah, I do it. Modern technology suits me more. I like modern technology because I can do things fast. I hate the slowness of the old analog way of working. And I think in an almost digital way, you know, because digital is speed. So, you know, I've just released a new book, The Kreuzberg Sonata, and I've got two other books finished because 
I ain't got much time left. I've got to really, really go for it. You know, so the future is bright, John. You know, I'm going to do a new armory show, a couple more books, and I want to play live, and I still want to have that relationship with people. So it's exciting. It's a very exciting time, I think. More exciting, really, than it's ever been. And now I've got a new band uh, to go out and try and create. Maybe the darker side of the skids will be seen at, at last. Brilliant. Well, thanks a lot, Rich, and thanks for your time. Uh, it's a joy to talk to you, John, as always. Thank you. You're a great yeah, man. Yeah, and I'll, I'll see you out on the circuit somewhere. <laughs> I've just had the I've just had the membranes hot sauce on my breakfast. <laughs>